months uh, pornography in our libraries. And fortunately, there are some people who are dedicated to doing something about it. And I don't mean going to the library and reading it. I mean stopping it. But we're going to get to that in a little while. Um, right now, what I'd like to do is play for you a translation of Vladimir Putin's remarks about what's happening in the United States today. Trump is concerned this is good for us in today's conditions because it shows the rottenness of the American system, which cannot pretend to teach others about democracy. All that is happening with Trump is the persecution of a political rival for political reasons. And this is done in front of the public of the United States and the whole world. As far as the prosecution of Trump is concerned, this is good for us in today's conditions because it shows the rottenness of the American system. Okay. Um, now, Vladimir Putin has a lot of reasons to say a lot of things. Um, I was actually curious what position he would take um, when asked publicly about the United States election that's coming up. And frankly, there's more coverage of the indictments against Trump than there is about the actual election coming up and what issues. Uh, part of that is our own fault, or the media's fault, for not covering the border, for not covering crime, for not covering. I can make more money in Los Angeles stealing things, $900 an hour, and not get arrested for a felony than I can for most jobs. I mean, okay, so the, what you just heard was Putin's translator uh, telling the world what Putin said, and, and that was that what's happening in America is actually un-American. Now, he didn't say that, but that's what I'm saying. Because he points out, and you can't really question what he's saying, he points out the fact that what is going on here is candidates are being arrested, booked, and charged with, with crimes. And the crimes are? No, they, they, they didn't plan to kill anybody. They didn't rob any banks. Um, no, they complained that the election in 2020 wasn't right. There's something wrong with it. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we all know, uh, historically, that's what the losers often do. Often. Let's say some names. Al Gore. Hillary Clinton. We can go back in history. Um, Richard Nixon, who lost to John F. Kennedy, he had... And I grew up in Chicago, most of you already know that, but I remember uh, the, the, the reason why Kennedy has been attributed to the victory in 1960 over Nixon was they held back the votes in Chicago until the last minute. And then the Democrats, who control Chicago, released the votes and, gosh, Kennedy won. So for, for years, Nixon talked about what not, and the media never covered it. It wasn't a big deal. They didn't want to deal. But this has been going on forever. But now it's different. 2023 histor history will remember this year that the leading candidate for president has been indicted. They want him to go to jail. Okay, so... Um, The one thing I wanted to talk about tonight is, and, and I'll spend a little bit of time on it Tuesday night, I'll spend some time. What's going on in Trump's cases? The best development, the funniest thing as a lawyer, I am, I'm hilarious at this. Okay, let's talk about the Fulton County indictment. There are 18 defendants, including President Trump. Okay, and their claim is, or the, the, the indictment says, that they had a, a, a criminal enterprise, and it's a RICO 
violation. This RICO is a statute that they use to go after organized crime members. Okay, and some prosecutors have effectively used it for other kinds of price gouging. They've used the commercial methods. They've used um, RICO in other cases. But <clears throat> this, in the political world, is is precedent setting. All right, now. It comes down to details, and one of the details that I read about today is absolutely hilarious. This is terrific. Okay, when you when you have decided and publicly named 18 people and say they were involved in a conspiracy to overthrow the country, okay, that's a that's a big deal. That's a big deal, and we already know that the number of documents that the government intends to rely upon is over 12 million. <laughs> it's impossible. So the question is, how will they ever get this trial off the ground? Okay, that's a big question. Now, let's be like, uh, use our surgical minds and, and break this down. Two of the defendants in the Fulton County case are two of the lawyers that represented Trump. In Fulton County, there's a rule. It says if you're a defendant and you want a speedy trial, you've got to ask for it. Or you waive that right. Get a speedy trial, or you can waive the right. Two of the defendants, two of the lawyers, and one of them is Sidney Powell. I love that. She's bright. I don't know if you know Sidney Powell. I've seen her. She's articulate. She's bright. She's nobody's fool. She's one of the two lawyers. And she says, I want my speech to try. One with a lawyer by the name Chestone, who's a fabulous writer. Okay. They may be tried as early as October 31st of this year. Now, if you're Trump and all the other guys, and you are named in the same indictment, <laughs> wouldn't you want to see the trial, all the evidence they're going to use, the witnesses they're going to call, what these witnesses are going to say? Probably a year, maybe two years before your trial even starts. Of course, uh, Fanny Willis, who is the district attorney, is opposing that, saying this is a waste of judicial resources, and it gives the defendants an unfair advantage. <laughs> I'm like, really? To know what you're going to do. It's almost as if Fannie Willis and many of the prosecutors have forgotten that their obligation is to turn over the evidence that they're going to use to the defendants before the trial. This is no, this is not a civil case where you try to hide things. It's a great case called the Brady case, which means if they've got any evidence that exculpates President Trump. Anyway, we're going to take a break. This is the Jack Clegg Show, Tuesday night edition, WGSO, 990 AM. And we'll be back after the break. <laughs> Hi, I'm Huck, an active Christian who loves Louisiana. One of my goals is to bring Louisiana's education from 50th to number one. And I'm Dave. I'm not afraid of government bureaucrats. I fear God. Our rights and freedoms come from Him. This is Liberty or Lockdown. Please join us on Thursdays at 5 p.m. on WGSO 990 AM and WGSO.com. Join me, B.J. Rusk, for the Something to Say radio show every weekday from 6 to 7 p.m. I'll be joined by Rudy Cicchini, and we will give our unique and fun thoughts on sports, music, entertainment, current events, and everything in between. Your calls are welcome, and you can also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at www.somethingtosayradioshow.com. 
the Something to Say radio show, weekdays at 6 p.m., only on WGSO 990 AM. Hello, this is Jack Clay. Thank you for listening and participating in the Jack Clay show, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Our audience and management have asked us to extend the show to Thursday nights at 7 p.m., and we will do that at least until the 2024 election is over. We will continue to oppose the rich men north of Richmond who want to control what we think and control what we do. Big Easy Pet Shop and Rescue is a nonprofit volunteer run rescue. We provide adoption services and care for homeless animals across the New Orleans metro area. We also offer pet supplies and grooming services at our downtown and Marigny locations. The shops are located at 839 Spain Street and 513 Dumaine Street and are open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. weekdays and noon to 6 on Saturdays, noon to 5 on Sundays. We can be found on the web at BigEasyPetShop.com. Support local animals in need by shopping and adopting with Big Easy Animal Rescue. Donate your vehicle and make a difference. WGSO 990 AM has partnered with Charitable Adult Rides and Services, also known as CARS, to allow you the opportunity to donate your car, truck, motorcycle, RV, or boat to our nonprofit organization. You may qualify for a tax deduction while supporting a cause that is near and dear to your heart. Simply go to WGSO.com and follow the link on our homepage. Vehicle donation pickup is always free to you, and most vehicles can be picked up within 24 to 72 hours. You'll receive an initial car donation receipt upon pickup, and then the CARS team will work to turn your car into cash to support our cause. Once your vehicle is sold, the CARS team will provide you proper tax forms in time to file. Their friendly donor support representatives are available seven days a week to assist throughout the process. Again, for more information, go to WGSO.com. All right, New Orleans. We're back. The Tuesday night edition is now the Thursday night edition of the Jack Clegg Show. All right, and I'm delighted to have three guests, not just guests, these are people who do what most of you sitting at home would like to do, but you don't, because you don't have the time, or there's always a reason why you don't, but these guys um, are really doing the work for all of us, and when I say all of us, I'm speaking for parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, anybody who knows a child whose future, for the first time in my lifetime, has a big question mark in it. And, and I, I, my, when my, my daughters are, are now 43 and 41, so you catch them at right about their age, that's how old they are. But when they were in school, I never wor- worried at all about their future. They would work hard, they would study hard, they would succeed. If they didn't work hard, if they didn't study hard, it would be a struggle. But that That's what we did. And we, we as, as at the time my wife and I, we put our faith in the system, in the schools. We didn't think it was necessary that we go to school and listen to what was being lectured. We didn't, we didn't think, of, we trusted them. Well, <laughs> There's now a generation of young people who there's a question mark. And and personally, personally, um, I have my ideas of where it comes from, what causes it, and so forth. But we have before us today three guests who are doing something about it, and that's what matters. We can all sit around and BS all we want to, but when you're doing something, that's what matters. And so I have three ladies here from the entity called Jefferson Assembly. And we're going to have a caller. We think we may. The caller is Kathleen Banfield. She's with the organization. And I have Dana Farley. Say hello, Dana. Hello. <laughs> Dana Fairley. Farley. 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 Yes. Farley. 
like the CEO of Ford Motor. That's right. That's all that's right. Kim D'Angino. Diagono. Diagono. I'm sorry. That's Kim. okay. Okay. And Jamie McAvoy. Jamie McAvoy. Hi. <laughs> right. Okay. And so, uh, Jamie, let me start with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me what the um, start of Jefferson Assembly, how did it start? What was its purpose initially? Sure. Um, so a group of us kind of got together just post-COVID everything or actually during COVID when it seemed like a lot of the world had lost their mind. Um, we got together and we started just trying to brainstorm as to like, what can we do? Um, so it really, I guess, started as a grassroots movement um, with um, the community of Jefferson Parish trying to say, okay, these are some of the issues that are happening. What can we do? And really it became, it just, we just started taking action um, in some various things, um, trying to combat some of the issues that we were facing in our parish, but as a nation as a whole, right? Right. And, 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 and it, for everyone who knows, this would include, and you, you would have children who go yeah. to school. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a mom. So that was like... You know, I have four kids, actually, and it was very disheartening to see these children go to school. Not only were they affected academically, they were affected emotionally with the masking and with the inappropriate um, um, requirements in, in, in requesting people's vaccination status and requesting um, if you want to do X, Y, and Z, we want you to have have your shots. If not, you have to test. Like, So it was emotionally belittling them. It was ostracizing them. Think, and, it, and so it was painful as a mom to watch that. Um, and so that's kind of the fire underneath me to, to gather people together to start in addressing some of these things. And so do you want me to tell you kind of how we started, well, what we did? Yeah, I wanna, but before you did, I want to get into the psychological aspects of it because what you, okay. we all understand, we all understand that when you have a child, they're helpless. Once they leave your house, they go out, and they go out, I'm sorry, good morning. Psychologically, we, we want to help and protect our children because once they go out, if they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old, they're at the mercy of the world. We can't be with them all the time. So we have to trust certain people who we don't know to have their best interests at heart. We do that. We all have to do that. And again, during COVID, my, my kids were all up and out. And, I didn't have little kids, but I can just imagine how a parent would feel um, with mandates. Now, and I want you to go on a little bit further after COVID, but uh, your particular school that your children were at was a school um, that had a relationship with the medical field, didn't it? Yeah. So go ahead and explain how that happened and explain how it morphed from COVID to where we are today. So, um, so we, m my children's school, they, they go to a charter school and the owners of that charter are affiliated with a big hospital. Um, and they actually own the rights, um, to a lot of these things that happened, um, during COVID. And so I believe we saw a bigger push with the masking, with the shots, with the testings, with all the things surrounding that. Um, and so one of the things we started doing was going to the school board to express our, and, you know, our, our disapproval and the fact that we felt like the, our rights as parents were being overlooked, were being undermined. Um, and really, it was almost like a, a you felt like bullied You're, and your children okay. felt bullied. Like, if we don't do this, we can't do this. You, you know, didn't send your kids off to school to be guinea pigs, did you? No. <laughs> and did you have a feeling that maybe this is what was happening? Yeah, but it wasn't going to happen with my kids. <laughs> I, 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 yes, and I, I believe you when you say that. Um, 
So how did, let me get some of the other speakers in here. Uh, Dana, how, how, did, how did you first get involved with Jefferson, Par Jefferson Assembly? Um, I, I think I just um, was aware of a meeting taking place, but I had been pretty, um, you know, socially active with um, lots of issues. Um, I even started out in 2016. I came home to New Orleans, my, my birthplace, um, after 20 years away and found out that my, my city hated history and wanted to remove it. <laughs> so, I mean, I've kind of been on the front line since 2016. Okay. And, uh, but, um, yeah, I, you know, knowing, you know, what I knew about, uh, COVID and, um, the, uh, the purpose of it, in my opinion, um, not saying that it wasn't real, but, um, you know, I, um, I wanted to get involved and help these parents mainly because my child was already in college. All right. And, 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 and we'll get to Kim right after the break. But um, so it is, and you use the word grassroots. This is truly a grassroots. None of you and I want to make you sign an oak. On an affidavit, none of you are taking money from George Soros. No, absolutely not. <laughs> he can keep his money. Right. We're, we're about to take a break, and we'll come back after the break uh, with our representatives from Jefferson Assembly, WGSO and WGSO.com. <laughs> When the time came, I knew I had to find a place where mom would be safe and active while still feeling independent. A place that was close to all of us and everything she needed. Locally owned and operated in the heart of Gonzales, I found Francois Ben Senior Living. They specialize in independent and assisted living and memory care. Call 225-647-BEND for more information on our special pre-leasing offers. Francois Ben Senior Living. Experience life as it should be. A business without signage is like a car with a flat tire. It's not going anywhere fast. Sir Speedy can change that. We're a trusted resource for sign design and production. Whether you need trade show displays, banners, posters, directional signs, window decals, wall graphics, or more, Sir Speedy sign capabilities can help your business get noticed. Call us today at 504-586-9812. Sir Speedy, we do it. Hey y'all, Beat Exchange has a new time slot on WGSO, 9.90 a.m. in New Orleans at 7 p.m. on Mondays. The Beat Exchange with Barbara Hoover. Mondays at 7 p.m. Hey, it's Christian. When it comes to buying appliances, buy where the builders buy, and that's at DTS Appliance Direct. Shop local. Don't go to the big box store when you need a new appliance. Call my friends at DTS Appliance Direct, 504-766-0738. DTS Appliance Direct has brands from GE, Cafe, Monogram, Plays Grilled, Sea line and many more. DTS Appliance Direct, 504-766-0738. 504-766-0738. Louisiana Radio Network, I'm Jeff Palermo. Classes were scheduled to resume at St. Helena College and Career Academy tomorrow, the site of a fatal shooting where authorities say a 14-year-old fatally shot a 16-year-old. But St. Helena Parish School District Superintendent Dr. Kelly Joseph says they will have children come back to the school on Tuesday instead. To give our employees more time to process all what has happened. Southeast Community Health System is providing counselors for teachers and will be on campus when students return Tuesday. We're a month away from the gubernatorial primary and the major Democrat in the race, Sean Wilson, has launched his first TV ad. In the spot, Wilson touts himself as someone who can bring everyone to the table to find common ground, unless you political science professor Robert Hogan. And that may be viewed as an antidote to the Landry campaign and Landry's really penchant for focusing on divisive issues in the last several years. Polls show Wilson facing Landry in a November runoff. Louisiana Radio Network. 
Hello, Governor John Bell Edwards here reminding you that it's hurricane season and now is the time to get a game plan. This year, that game plan will also need to include protective measures against the ongoing COVID-19 public health crisis. Closely monitor the weather and follow the advice of local officials. Being proactive is the best way to keep you and your family safe this hurricane season. For more information, please visit getagameplan.org. Be safe and God bless. I'm Jim Harper, president of the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Agriculture is big business in our state. $11 billion a year for Louisiana's economy. When other businesses had to shut their doors, our essential Louisiana farmers and ranchers continue to provide each of us with the food and fiber we need to survive. That's why I'm a proud member of the Louisiana Farm Bureau family. Visit LAFarmBureau.org, the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Hi, this is Kevin Carr, host of Fat Guys at the Movies. Listen every Sunday at 8 p.m. on WGSO 990 AM, the community voice of the Crescent City. Hey, Mimi, we're moving. Moving to Wednesdays at 5. You can check out He Said, She Said on a new day. Hump day. A new day, but we'll still be discussing and debating the hot topics. And take your phone call. You can listen to us on 990 AM, WGSO, WGSO WGSO.com. And find out who's right. Of course, that's me. No, of course, that's me. I've been doing this 23 years, Mimi. Practice makes perfect. So you see, we'll have plenty to talk about on He Said, She Said. Wednesdays at 5. Right here on WGSO. WGSO 990 AM is the only locally owned and operated talk station in New Orleans. We feature 20 local hosts discussing a variety of topics in an era when the daily newspaper is being discontinued and our competitors are out of state media conglomerates. We ask you, our listeners, to support local programming on a local station. To advertise or sponsor one of our great shows, contact me at Jeff at WGSO.com or call 504 669 606. The fastest growing conservative talk show in the South is now on five days a week on WGSO 990. That's right. American Ground Radio has moved from Saturdays to Monday through Friday from 8 to 9 p.m. American Ground Radio is based out of Louisiana and is grounded in the ideas that founded our country. American Ground Radio is a show for everyone who believes there is greatness within each of us. So tune in Monday through Friday starting at 8 p.m. on the community voice of the Crescent City WGSO 990. 990 AM. Everything old is new again is changing time from 1 o'clock on Saturdays to 9 a.m. WGSO 990 AM. David Cohen, what do you think? Well, we've got to wake up earlier, but I'm just as excited for 9 o'clock. How about that? Everything old is new again. Going to wake up New Orleans. <laughs> Jack Clegg show. This is the Thursday night edition, and we're honored, honored to have guests from Jefferson Assembly. This began as a grassroots group of parents uh, in Jefferson Parish, fighting back what most of us wanted to fight about, but we didn't have the guts to do it. And that was the government mandates, the requirement that children wear masks when there wasn't any science to support that. And all of us knew it was bad, but the people sitting with me actually did things about it. And, and that's a difference. And, and before we go on any further about the history of it, um, Jamie, can you give us some information? If, if there are parents out there or grandparents or uncles or aunts or, or godparents who want to get involved and want to help out. And we're going to talk about this for the rest of the show, this horrible, horrible stuff that's going on in our libraries. How would they get in touch with your organization? How could they help? Well, the easiest way for them to get involved would be to reach out. And you can find us at jpassembly.com com and there's a connect page there and if you send us a message we'll connect with you and let you know when we meet and so forth so that you can help us out and and, and it's really it, it doesn't take much time you think oh well, i got to do this i have to do this i have to do this i what's more important <laughs> you know what is more important than 
being there, we know that our children are being taught things they shouldn't be taught. We know that there's a certain group of teachers, and, and I was a teacher once, they're great teachers, but somehow there's some misdirection going on. And now there are teachers who, we, as parents, we're saying they are indoctrinating our children. We would never use those terms before. But this happened. Well, organizations like Jefferson Assembly are all over the country. And this is why America is so great, is because we can do this. The FBI hasn't come and knocked on your door, have they yet, no, I've had some crazy things happen, but they have not come and knocked on my door. <laughs> okay. And, and until they do, and when they do, the show is going to be about something else. But right now, the, the show is, in, in, hopefully, introducing Jefferson Assembly to responsible parents and grandparents and, and other adults who want to stop this, not by by burning down and things or doing any violence or anything, but really just exposing what's happened. I think the people in Virginia and Loudoun County who started this maybe a year and a half ago, we owe them a debt. We really do. And now it's all over the country. Let me go on further. Kim, how did you get into this, Kim? So Jamie and I are close friends, and basically we just started talking, and we had these concerns and she said, um, we both, our faith is extremely important to us. And she said, you know, the Lord's putting this on my heart. And I said, let's do it. You know, I want to be a part of it. Well, and, 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 and as I said before, um, this is not just Louisiana. I, I, in preparing for the show, uh, I, I looked at as many articles as I could to find out how big this issue was. And I learned quite a bit about it. Uh, and, and speak up as I'm speaking to, to correct me if I'm um, incorrect, but most of the libraries throughout America are affiliated with the American Library Association. Is that true, ladies? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And now I've heard on television, I've heard uh, and I've read that the actual leader of the American Library Association has affiliations that none of us, none of us, would want that person teaching our child or making a decision that this book over this book should be read by our child. Am I exaggerating? Nope. Oh, no, not at all. When you're a self-proclaimed Marxist, um, that's probably uh, why you're concerned. Right. Okay. And so going further. So as I talked about a moment ago, Senator, uh, Governor Youngkin of, of Virginia and, and people in Loudoun County and some of the others fought back. And, and an election changed. That changed the gubernatorial position of Virginia. Okay. Now, state after state after state have done what you guys have done. And as Jamie was saying a while ago, your organization, grassroots, is a bunch of people that were resisting COVID mandates. Okay. COVID, fortunately, has kind of died down. How was it that you got into the library? What can I call it? Uh, cultural war. The cultural <laughs> war. Yeah, we can call it that. How, how did you get into that? Oh, uh, well, I was actually. I was praying um, because I felt that things were shifting with COVID. Um, some of the mandates and restrictions had let up some. And so I really was just praying because I knew that, hey, it wasn't just COVID, right? We're, there's a lot of things happening right now. And I know that I am going to have to be in this fight because I have children and I have um, you know, uh, to do my due di diligence as um, a believer in God and Christ. And so I um, was in prayer and I felt like this, this, I was actually scrolling through on, on some social media and one of these books, which was an inappropriate book for teenagers, it was teaching them all about the ins and outs of sex. And I was like, 
like my heart began to pound and and I and I and I sense the Lord say pay attention to this. And so I started just researching a little bit and I said, "Well, you know what? Maybe there is inappropriate literature in the library. Let me go just stroll around." So I went to the library and I started looking and looking and looking and my goodness, the amount of books starting with the little bitty kids all the way up to the adults where the children have access to all of these books, um, things on pornography, pedophilia, inappropriate things, mixed sexual ideologies that are essentially like attempting to groom a child, indoctrinate and confuse a child. Like I left the place feeling disgusted and thinking that a child actually has access to this. I felt even more disgusted. And so I knew that that's what we needed to focus on. And there we started. Well, following that up. Okay. So at that time, try to go back to that time. Did you know who it was that made a choice to put those books in the library? Did you have any idea? I had no idea. Okay. So now it's how many months later or years later, we now have identified part of the problem. And that is who it is that puts those books in the library. Yeah, it's been a few months, but we, we have identified, you know, it's a top down system, the ALA. Um, That's the American Library Yeah, the American Library Association. They're the ones that make the recommendations for the most part for the libraries. Um, and then most parishes have what's called a control board. Um, specifically in Jefferson Parish, they have what's called an advisory board. And so, um, you know, if there's an issue with a book, you would have to contest the book or go before the control board. Um, but in Jefferson Parish, it was an advisory board. So we wrote letters contesting several books. We went to the advisory board for one of their meetings, but we were told that they were not the ultimate decision makers that we needed to go to the parish council. Um, I even read one of these books that was like a kindergarten first grade book. And you could tell in the atmosphere, everyone was uncomfortable. When you look at these pictures of children touching their private areas with crazy looks on their face, like why does a kindergartner in fact, that book was written by um, the, the author had a sex shop. And those are the types of books that are permitted in the library. Like every parent needs to know that there's no filtration system when it comes to the books that are put in the library system. Right. Okay. And, 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 and so Jefferson Assembly kind of took a, a, a deviation from COVID which was killing a lot of us, to the goal of preventing the deaths of our children in the future from what we're going on to now. Do I take a break? Ronald says we have to take a break. But Ronald says goes. All right, this is the Thursday night edition of the Jack Flag Show, uh, WJSO. I wish we had a two-hour show tonight. we got another uh, 15 minutes coming up afterwards. We're going to talk about... Um, what we can do to stop this. And it's a, it's a, there's a wide, wide array of things. Most ladies have been thinking about it. I'm going to get back to that after the break. Join me, BJ Rust, every weekday at 6 p.m. for the Something to Say radio show. We'll talk sports, music, current events, everything in between. That's weekdays, 6 p.m., only on WGSO 990 AM. The Louisiana Music and Heritage Experience presents NOLA Funk Fest, October 20th through the 22nd at the New Orleans Jazz Museum. This festival includes three days of our local beloved music, food, art, and fun, plus a special Fats Domino and Dave Bartholomew exhibit. The festival will feature Irma Thomas, Leo Nocentelli, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, George Porter Jr. and the Running Partners, and so much more. For tickets and more information, go to nolafunkfest.com. 
Hi, I'm William Wallace. You can hear me live on Tuesday nights at 5 o'clock here on WGSO or see what I have to say on Facebook at William Wallace for America. Don't miss Hurd's Louisiana Live from 4 to 5 Monday through Friday. Paul Hurd exposes and explains state government's daily shenanigans, exposes our excess taxes, and explains how we can get to real community safety. Heard will challenge your legislators to repeal taxes and grow Louisiana. Repeal and grow is the name of the game. Heard's Louisiana Live is coming in hot every day at 4 p.m. Only on WGSO 990 AM. Join me, Mitch Gibbs, every Monday and Friday at 5 p.m. Live at Premier Nissan at 6636 Veterans Boulevard, where Metairie meets Kenner for our 12th season in the Red Zone. The Tux Charitable Foundation, in association with the crew of Tux Parade, is holding the 4th Tux Umbrella Walk and Gumbo Gras on October 28th at 9 a.m. in Audubon Park, Shelter No. 10 off Magazine Street. Food, drink, live music are all included with registration. This is where Mardi Gras meets Halloween, and everyone is encouraged to come in costume. Kids' activities include the Small Friars Umbrella Decorating Tent, Decorated Wagon Parade, and Small Friars Fun House. Please go to www.tuxfoundation.org for information and registration. Got your license to grill? Call Chew on This Saturdays at noon on WGSO and tell us all about it. Don Clement and Patty B are waiting to hear your cooking secrets. Boy, have we got a show for you this week. Ever wonder where all the great songs have gone? Well... We found them. Hey, everyone, I'm Pat Matthews, your host at 70s Deja Vu. And once again, I'll be looking in the rearview mirror, and I'll see you in the back seat. Join me for some great music, all selected to get you going on 70s Deja Vu. Sunday morning at 7 a.m., right here on 990 AM WGSO. You can check out He Said, She Said on a new day. Hump day. A new day, but we'll still be discussing and debating the hot topics. Wednesdays at 5. Here on WGSO. You might be afraid to speak out for fear of cancel culture or losing your job. Christian Garrick Show on WGSO is your platform. Noon to 2, weekdays, right here on 990 AM WGSO. <laughs> This is the Jack Frank Show, there's another edition. You're listening to WGSO 9 a.m. and WGSO.com. Um, we're going to now talk about um, what Jefferson Assembly has already accomplished and done. We're going to talk about some, what would you call them, uh, roadblocks that have been put in place. And then hopefully we'll get Kathleen Banfield to join us and tell us what's going on in legislation. So, uh, right now, Dana, could you just give us a quick rundown of what you guys will accomplish? Well, since we've been focusing on this issue, we have been attending Jefferson Parish Library Board meetings um, to express our concern about the books. We've written letters to the board about specific books, uh, wanting them to be placed in a separate area um, with parental consent to be able to be taken out uh, and, and uh, taken out and read by children. Uh, we've also gone to the legislature in Baton Rouge and have spoken at committee hearing, re committee hearing uh, to, especially for the veto override session, which just happened. And Kathleen will be able to run that down for you to see what, you know, to tell you what we've accomplished there. Uh, we've also spoken at the Jefferson Parish Council meeting because they are the ultimate decision makers about the library board. And we've also had smaller meetings with Ricky Template, um, Cynthia Lee Shang's uh, people, and Jessica Stion, who is the president of the library board. Plus, one more thing, we have done a brave book reading, which are the Kirk Cameron books, the wholesome books at the Jefferson Parish Library. Okay, before we get to... Kathleen, um, Kim, I want, I want, we have public libraries, and we've been talking about public libraries, but also we have libraries in every school. Please tell the audience what, what happened when you asked to look through some of those school libraries. Right, so we were at a particular school, and we were at the board meeting, which happened to be in the library. 
So this topic had come to our attention and we wanted to see if the books were in the library and we were told that we could not do that at that time. We would have to make an appointment for another time to review the books. And when you tried to make an appointment, what did they do? They put you up again, didn't they? Well, yes. I mean, that's that's the protocol, you know, yeah. that, that we're not given the freedom to go into the school libraries. These are schools we pay for with our taxes. Well, I'm not a Jefferson Parish guy, but a Jefferson Parish people pay for. Okay. Kathleen, welcome to the hey. show. Hi there. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm just honored to be with those ladies. They are a powerhouses of uh, right about that. You're getting right. something done. Can you tell us a little bit? Now, we've talked about the legislative session. There were several vetoes by our Democratic uh, governor, Mr. Bell Edwards, mm -hmm. and yeah. some of them were overturned and some of them were not. Can you give us a little summary in the areas that we're talking about uh, of what happened in the legislature and, and what you would recommend that we do and focus on in the coming days? Sure. Well, uh, the Attorney General, Jeff Landry, had proposed a bill, had proposed some language that was later picked up by Senator Heather Cloud to make some minimal standards that the libraries have, the public libraries, not the school libraries, but the public libraries have to employ to protect children from the uh, sexually explicit material. So that bill did pass, and it is now in effect. Uh, well, it goes into effect. It's actually giving the library some time to actually uh, get that going and to adopt card systems and so forth. So that's moving. And that was a huge step. That was a huge step because the library people who uh, many of them are in communicate, constant communication with the American Library Association, sure. Sure. getting legal advice. Believe it or not, they get legal advice contrary to the state law of Louisiana from the American Library Association. And the ALA assists them in rebuffing mm -hmm. the citizens who pay the bills for the libraries. So, okay, but um, there were several other bills in this same sort of thing. And uh, one of them was House Bill 648, which was a bill that would prohibit the gender procedures on children, including puberty blockers, wrong sex hormones, and surgical utilization, mutilation of the children. That bill uh, passed the legislature overwhelmingly, was vetoed by the governor, but then the subsequent veto override. So right. that bill is being implemented now, although the, the effective date is not until next year. And then there were two other bills that were wonderful. We know that the schools are socially transitioning children behind the backs of parents. Uh, they are using wrong pronouns to refer to children, biologically and grammatically incorrect pronouns. Uh, they're calling them by names that do not apply to the child. And, and they're talking about sexual topics with children, like their own sexual orientation and so forth. Those bills passed easily out of the legislature, were vetoed by the governor. They were overridden in the House, but the Senate did not consider them. So those bills... Um, failed because of the veto and then were not overridden. So I always hate to ask somebody to give the opinion of what someone else is, but what was the argument in favor of vetoing that, that law? What, what, what did, was the governor's explanation for it? Well, the governor used a lot of legal word salad to say why he didn't like it, and he brought up a bunch of parade of horribles that were going to happen with the bill. But basically... The community that was advocating for those bills um, is part of Governor John Bell Edwards' base. Sure. So he was basically working for his base, and um, uh, there were, you know, people that came and, you know, again, a parade of horribles of what's going to happen if, you know, these children don't get to go through the transitioning. But, uh, you know, their state, this, Louisiana is one of like 22 maybe or maybe 24 states that have passed similar legislation about the medical transitioning. Sure. And so it's not crazy. Uh, there's a lot of science behind why this is bad for children. Right. And we don't, you know, we don't let children decide that they're going to go play in the street, but we're going to let them decide that they're going to permanently alter their bodies and never be able to conceive 
or participate in the conception of children. I, I had a show a couple of weeks ago that, that I had a show a couple of weeks ago that you might think was interesting. On a federal level, do you know if there's a federal agency supporting gender affirming care and promoting oh, gender affirming care? Tons of them. Yes, the Department of Education is just one. The Department of Health and Human Services is another. Got it. In the Department right? of Health and Human Services, there's a small office in charge of gender affirming care for young right. people. It's called the Office of Population Affairs. Wow. Right. If you don't think that those folks have a master plan in place, they do. You're they, do. they do. They do. Of course they do. The Department of Education is using this social transitioning in the schools as the carrot and stick oh, yeah. to and make this, they're with they're threatening to withhold funding if the schools don't go along with their wicked plan of convincing a little boy that he can grow up to be a girl or a girl can grow up to be a boy. Yep. Well, I, I want to thank you for um, and, and all of the women and men of Jefferson Assembly. Is there something you want to say before we before we complete? I would just. Um, reiterate about the legislator and the the actual votes that took place in this override session please check uh with with your legislature to find out if your representative voted yay or nay well what we're going to do and i i in blood i had all these women sign in blood that they would return in about two weeks and at that time maybe we can name some names who voted yes who voted no it would be that's an a, idea. And, and just, we don't have to make a judgment. Okay. How are we doing on our time, Ronald? Five minutes? Ten seconds? Ladies, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate Thank it. You Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. I want you to come yeah. back and we'll we're be back. Continue. Thank we'll you. Continue. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to Show New Orleans. It's on at midnight, and I'm loving Fort New Orleans. What a group of fantastic listeners here on WGSO 990 AM. Join me every morning to catch up on what I call the buzz in your backyard and mine. You'll hear some of the most interesting people on the planet from the world of business, politics, 